Let us beset the just one, because he is obnoxious to us. So began our first reading from the Book of Wisdom. The author of that book says some shocking stuff, some tough things, and some violent and hateful things. At Mass, we hear lots of scripture passages, but this, these verses are some of the most sobering. If you happen to be daydreaming during the proclamation, heaven forbid, let me tell you what you missed. The author is relaying what the wicked say, what the wicked are thinking, feeling, and hoping to do against the just one. This could mean any person. However, we Catholic Christians see a certain forewarning of what will ultimately happen to Jesus, the just one, the one who, deserved, who didn't deserve one bit of what he had to go through. We hear how the wicked will put him to the test through revilement and torture, condemning him to a shameful death. We hear how the wicked are against the just, the just one, because he sets himself against their doings, that is, he calls them out for their wicked ways. In addition, in a verse that drips with arrogance, hatred, and cruelty, the wicked say, let us see whether his words are true. Let us find out what will happen to him. Now that's cold, really cold. Then come the words that sort and punctuate the entire passage. Words that sound to us today as sarcastic and very cynical. For according to his own words, God will take care of him. Clearly, the wicked don't believe that, not a chance. Instead, their words take on the form of a kind of mockery, a ridiculing of people on the side of goodness, kindness, and mercy. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read passages like that, when I reflect in particular on what happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago, I think to myself, thank God I wasn't one of those people who put him to death, either by my actions or silence. Thank God I didn't accuse him, ridicule him, or gossip about him. Thank God I didn't take certain pleasures in seeing this instigator silenced, this person who was ultimately going to get the Romans upset, which could only lead to one thing, hardship for all of us. Yes, seeing how this all worked, I'm very glad I didn't have a part in any of that. Or did I? Let's pivot for a moment and take a look at the opposite side of the coin. Let's take a look at the words of Jesus in today's Gospel of Mark. The disciples had been arguing about who was the greatest among them, and Jesus spells it out pretty clearly for them. If anyone wishes to be first, he shall be the last of all and servant of all, and whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. You know, I guess I don't want to have any part of that one either. It just seems too hard. It seems too much of a commitment and costs too much. I just don't have it in me. Or do I? Now, many things in life are gray, things that don't present us with an either-or kind of a choice. We can do this or that without much consequence. But a good life, a moral life, a holy life is different from that. Let me explain. <clears throat> I can't suggest that it's either clear or obvious what the right thing to do is. Often we have to wrestle with our conscience and try to figure what God is asking of us in any particular situation. And that's not easy. I'm suggesting that each failure to love is a kind of sharing in the death of Jesus. As if we were one of those people long ago who wanted him silenced. On the flip side, every loving act, every selfless act, is also a participation in the death of Jesus. But not on the side of those who condemned him, but rather as if we were walking hand in hand with him up that lonely hill, accompanying him rather than distancing ourselves from him. Simply put, each sinful act, each selfless act, places us in solidarity with those who put Jesus to death. But each loving act, each holy act, places us in solidarity with Jesus himself, places us in communion with him, in communion with all that is good, beautiful, and precious. It places us in communion with God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Will we love as a parent loves a child? Will we put others first and ourselves last? Or 
Will we take the easy way out, foolishly striving to preserve our own lives while watching Jesus lose his? Brothers and sisters in Christ, we're standing on Calvary. Who are we standing on?